Hello folks, welcome to a new week on World War II TV and we have two programs today finishing off or concluding our Channel Islands at War Week. So later on today at 7pm UK time, Eric Lee is coming on to talk about the 80th anniversary of the Commando Raid Operation Basalt that took place, well, 80 years ago today. Um, if you saw last week's shows, we covered the Atlantic Wall, we covered the occupation with Duncan Barrett, but now we're going a little bit darker, a little bit more to the, the, the side of the occupation that is really revealed the kind of the, the horror of the Third Reich. So my guest, Dr. Jilly Carr, is an archaeologist. Her speciality is conflict history and the Holocaust. And um, she's joining me now. So good afternoon, Jilly. How are you today? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? I'm Well, I've got a, this cold I can't get rid of, but apart from that, I'm good. So as I said there in the top of the show there, that the Channel Islands had the breadth of every type of experience from, from just people at the bottom end, sort of food rationing things like that right up to people victims of of atrocities and everything in between but you, you've become something of a, an ambassador for for telling this story of the deportations and the and the darker side of the channel islands so before we bring up your presentation how did you get involved in this side of it and and why um, well, I mean, my family's from the Channel Islands. My mum's a Guernsey girl and my husband is from Guernsey. I met him on field work. Um, that's how I got into it. But I mean, what we're going to be talking about today is more, uh, it isn't the darkest part, actually. The darkest part, and I'm very happy to come back and talk to you about this on a later date, is about the deportation of political prisoners to concentration camps and labour camps and Nazi prisons. Um, but the deportations we're going to be talking about today are to civilian internment camps, which is a different sort of camp. Well, and, and I'm glad you cleared that up, because as soon as any we ever cover camps on World War II, we have to be clear about our language, because there's every type from workers' camps to the death camps to, to labour camps, everything else in between. So um, we'll, we'll cover that. So, folks... What Dr. Carr is going to do is kind of do a presentation first and then we will do questions at the end. But if there is something that comes up while we're going through pertaining to one of the particular slides or questions, we will deal with them as we go. But kind of bigger questions we'll do at the end. Um, but I'm going to power up uh, Dr. Carr's PowerPoint and we will look at the deportations and folks, as I say, just sit back and, and learn. But say if you have questions, do fire away, please. Yeah, thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions at all. I'm really, you know, I always say that, um, although we're not, this isn't a classroom, but I always say to my students, you know, the, the learning space is a, it's a safe space to ask any questions at all. And that's fine. So, um, yeah, thank you for, for inviting me on today. And uh, some people might know I'm a, an associate professor at the University of Cambridge. I work in conflict archaeology, in history, in heritage studies and in Holocaust studies and um, I mean I've just got so many interests and as time passes I sort of collect more and more but what I'm going to be talking to you today about is the deportations from the Channel Islands of 1942 and 1943 and actually this is a subject close to my heart because seven members of my own family were deported at this time so from my father's family my my mum's family has, has been in Guernsey since uh, the 1670s but my dad's family came to Guernsey uh, between about 1910 and 1947 and uh, as we'll discover some of the people deported were targeted because they had been born in the United Kingdom. But let's start at the beginning. And I am going to uh, start with, oh, well, one of the things I want to say to you right at the beginning is because I'm an archaeologist, I'm really interested in objects and how objects can tell the story of war and tell the story of conflict and the experience of conflict. And so the um, as well as objects, you can't divorce objects from artworks that were that were made in internment camps. And so I'll be using mostly images of these to illustrate my talk today. And some of these items are in private collections. Some of them are from Jersey archives, some of them from Guernsey archives. So I should think that most of these images are copyrighted. So we're going to, um, I'm just going to go through an introduction to the deportation. So let people know the historical background, because this is um, a really important way of setting the scene. So the first question to clear up is why were people deported? Well, as I say, we are not talking about the deportation of political prisoners here. Um, we're not even talking 
about the deportation of Jewish people that happened in April 1942, although there were British Jews included in this deportation order. Um, we're talking about the deportations of 1942 and 1943, and people were deported because Britain wanted to invade Persia um, or uh, Iran. And um, they, Britain wanted to invade for the oil of this country. And there were many German citizens working in Persia. They were working as engineers. And when the British invaded, they rounded up those Germans and deported them to Australia. So when Hitler learned about this, he wanted to, um, to take revenge upon British people. And the only British people he had under his control were those in the occupied Channel Islands. So that is why people were deported. When did this take place? Well, I'm going to be talking about the two waves of deportations, and they happened in September 1942 and February 1943. So there were two main waves of deportations, and different types of people were targeted in each of those waves. So in September 1942, the people who were targeted were for those who were born outside the Channel Islands, for the most part, people who were born in the, in the United Kingdom. And not all of those people were, if you like, non-Indigenous Channel Islanders, because uh, a number of those deported were those whose Channel Island parents happened to be working in the UK. And so they were born in the UK, but they were still Indigenous Islanders, if you like. But the reason why Hitler um, wanted Indigenous uh, non-Indigenous island and Islanders to be deported because Hitler thought that, or the Germans thought that the um, the English were the people who were more likely to carry out acts of resistance and therefore were troublemakers who needed to be removed from the island. So those were the people targeted in the first waves of September 1942. In the second wave in February 1943, and I should say that was targeted by um, that was part of the people targeted in that wave were targeted because of Operation Basalt, which you say is, is coming up. So um, Operation Basalt was a raid of commandos on the island of Sark, British commandos. And um, the Germans wanted to take revenge for that raid. So they de they deported a number of people from the island of Sark in 1943. So Sark is the fourth largest of the Channel Islands. Channel Islands, uh, in order of size, Jersey, Guernsey, Alderney, Sark and Herm, so five islands. Um, so we've got people from people who lived in the coastal area of Sark. Sark is a small island, so you could say, well, doesn't everyone live on the coast? But mostly those along the coast were deported. The second group of people who were deported in February 1943 were British Jews. So these are people who um, either had been born British or who acquired British nationality through marrying a local person. So that included some Jews who came over in the 1930s as refugees who married local people and got British nationality. But, but as I say, there's multiple ways of getting British nationality. You can be born British. The third group and the most numerous group deported in 1943 were people who had served as officers in the First World War. Uh, you know, people with military training. Obviously, the Germans wanted to get rid of them because mm. they could have trained a resistance movement. And the next group in 1943 were people who had served time in prison or had got prison sentences uh, for offences against the Germans. In other words, for carrying out acts of protest, defiance or resistance. So basically, it was sort of people who were troublemakers as far as the Germans were concerned. Now, if you look at the deportation list, you can also see a few other people itemized, such as priests, um, unemployed people, people who are seen to be work shy, but there's only small numbers of those. Those those aren't those don't comprise major categories. And just How one question for you, uh, Jenny, uh, because <laughs> I'm wondering whether it connects with Monday's show last week with Phil Merritt, where he was referring to the Atlantic Wall in the Channel Islands as being kind of a showcase for the for the Third Reich of how they do Atlantic Walls. In your study of the deportees, is there any way that you could say that the Channel Islands would like a case study of an example, the Third Reich, again, how they're going to treat um, occupied territories generally, or, or is the Channel Islands mm -hmm. just... just the Channel Islands is different. And I think it's very important to understand that every single country occupied by the Germans was treated differently, yeah. depending on nationality, depending on where they were in the Nazi racial hierarchy, depending on where in Europe they were, depending on 
the actions of the local government and the arrangements made with the local government and also depending on the terrain because um, that also dictated if you've got mountains you've got forests you then have people who can join the resistance and go and hide yeah. in those areas but there's nowhere to hide in the channel islands so i would say uh, the answer to your question is no never okay. expect one word answer from an academic i'm afraid there's always <laughs> no, no, but it was a good answer so i'm, so I'm happy with that so that's anyway. okay OK, so how many were affected? We are talking about 2,300 people in all. And what happened to their homes, those who once they were deported? Well, often people would hand over their keys to their neighbours and say, well, look after my house. But at the same time, when you have got somewhere between two hours and one week's notice of being deported, that was sort of the notification time, depending on the precise date you went, because there were multiple sailings of boats that people were put on. Um, Sometimes their houses were looted and stripped by other people because it was believed they weren't coming back. Sometimes the Germans um, commandeered those houses and put the troops in. Uh, it really depended. It really depended. But for the most part, um, although it is known that many of the deportees um, came back to find their houses had been given to other people from under them and had been comprehensively looted, it is, I believe, far more widespread than people have ever given credit for. I mean, it, it was numbers were never counted about this, but I think it's the, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it's that the majority of people had this sort of thing. Wow. So let's, let's get on to, this is one of, I think, only two photographs that survive of the deportations taking place. This one is in St. Helier in Jersey. And we have to remember that cameras were confiscated, were illegal, excuse me, illegal in World War II uh, in the Channel Islands. They were, um, yeah, they were, they were confiscated and it was a crime to be found with a camera. Um, the Germans could search your house and it was enough to be sent to a concentration camp if you were found with one. So therefore, we know that this photograph was taken. It had to be taken by a German soldier. Um, uh, Thank you for forwarding that. Yes, I forwarded it on my laptop and not here. There we go. So um, let's think about the journey from the Channel Islands to the internment camps. And these are beautifully illustrated by internees from the, their journey. So let's just start here. I'm going to start with the left hand side one. Can you see my cursor? No, it doesn't work on stream. You have to have to describe where you're pointing. Okay. So if you look at the left hand side image and the top left corner, you can see what looks like a little castle with a flag with Jersey yeah. written on it and a little lighthouse. That is showing the journey by boat across to St. Malo in France. And as you go around the frame of the picture, if you go down the right hand side of that left hand picture, you can see the boat berthed in St. Malo and people getting yeah. onto a train that then travels as you draw your eye around the picture through France through Belgium. Belgium. Train is powering along the, the bottom of the page, up through Luxembourg, the Moselle Valley, arriving in Germany. And this is Biberach camp. So we'll come back to that later. Let's go over to the right hand side picture and we can see something uh, a little similar. What we can see are snapshots um, of the various sites through the train window. So we can see pictures of, uh, if we look at the top right hand uh, corner of the right hand picture you can see a broken bridge beneath it you can see bombs falling blowing up a building you can see battleships towards the bottom you can see more bombs on the left hand side and you can also see uh, wrapped around the pillars of that image you can see the names of towns or cities as people pass through them so uh, and the the destination in this image at the bottom is Wurzak. So that was the name of another one of the internment camps. So we'll we'll get on to those in a second. So let's just um, head to our map to see where those camps were that people went to. So I'm going to start with Dorston. I was there last week and I will uh, tell you a little bit about that in just a second. But in the September 1942 waves of deportation, people were sent first to Dorston camp and then to Biberach camp in the south and from there, um, sometimes onto Wurzak, sometimes if the, the camps were for different types of people. So Laufen camp was for the un unattached men. So that meant unmarried men, but also the men whose wives had evacuated to the UK before the Germans came. 
So Laufen was for single men. Bibrach was for families from Guernsey. Uh, Wurzach was for families from Jersey. Liebenau was for single women. But Dawson was the transit camp en route to the others in 1942, and Compiègne was the transit camp en route to the others in 1943. So I should say that although the deportation orders targeted men between the ages of 16 to 70 who fell into the categories I mentioned, it affected their dependents. So it affected their wives, their children. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't get you off the hook if you had tiny baby, if your wife was heavily pregnant, if you were ill, um, there was a medical board that you could go to to try and get approval for uh, exemption. And the local doctors in the Channel Islands exempted loads of people, but then they had to go before a German medical board and the Germans reversed all of those exemptions. So we have very few images from Dorsten. Dorsten was a terrible camp and it was terrible because there were no Red Cross parcels uh, and that meant people were existing on watery soup. So they were there for seven weeks and the you can imagine trying to feed a baby watery soup. Um, the Everybody's weight dramatically plummeted in those seven weeks. So it became very hard for women who were breastfeeding to feed their babies because there was a difficulty in producing milk and especially nutritious milk. Um, the men were put in this picture. You can see some what looks like wooden barrack blocks at the back of the, the image. Um, the men were put there. So they had leaking roofs. There was no glass in the windows, only shutters. The women were put in these concrete buildings in the foreground. Uh, on triple decker bunks packed close together. Um, there was so it, the problem with having very inadequate food, and there was also very inadequate sanitation. So it, it was a month before people were allowed to take their first brief cold shower. Otherwise, people had to wash themselves and their clothes and their kiddies in an outdoor cold water trough. So, what people would do is they'd fill their soup bowl with water take it inside their barrack block and kind of give themselves a mop down. So it was really no way to keep clean. The toilets were holes in the ground. Um, so it was filthy. There was also Dawson's an industrial city, or at least it was in 1942. There was a, a colliery one mile from the camp and all of the flecks of coal fell on the deportees. So their hair, their skin, their clothes and their lungs went black. <laughs> Um, wow. And so you've got a problem of cold, of hunger, of dirt, of misery. And after a fortnight of being there, the first deportee, James Waters, died of pneumonia. Uh, within less than a fortnight later, a four month old baby also died of pneumonia. And then less than a fortnight after that, Florence Manning died of pulmonary edema, which is caused by fluid on the lungs, as is pneumonia. So. Uh, illness and disease became a big problem and people's the, the camp's morale just dropped with every death and on the day they were due to leave the camp the 11th of November that's when Florence Manning died so her husband stayed behind one day to see his wife buried but it broke everyone's heart to leave their loved ones behind mm. in a German <clears throat> cemetery probably thinking that they would never get to go back to that cemetery Let's look at the next picture. Uh, so this you, is you, you, you explained a bit about the, the physical conditions. So, you know, concrete and lack of water and, and sanitation, all that. But on a, it's a difficult question to answer, possibly. But on a kind of a scale of one to ten, how degrading was the experience? Because, I mean, I'm sure people watching this, they're thinking very much about the, the Auschwitz kind of transports elsewhere yeah. in, in World War Two. Well, so, I mean, is it kind of knife point and bayonet point and, uh, or is it more orderly? I mean, it's hard, I realise it's a hard question to, yeah, answer, I think, to answer. I think the right question to ask is, I mean, you flag up Auschwitz. So let's compare it to Auschwitz for a right. second. We have to remember at Auschwitz, there was forced labor. There was no forced labor in Dorsten. At Auschwitz, there were gas chambers, there were crematoriums. That was not the case at Dorsten. 
Um, there was gross ill treatment in Auschwitz. There wasn't endorsed them beyond what I've said. Right. People continued to wear their clothes. As we know in Auschwitz, people were tattooed, their heads were shaved, they were put in striped pajamas, which were thin and inadequate for the cold temperatures. Uh, we're also comparing autumn in Germany with winter in Poland as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. because of course, so it's not as bad as Auschwitz, but it is the worst of all civilian internment camps that the islanders were in so it's pretty bad but not on an auschwitz scale yeah i mean i mean even even it came up in the cyber even the fact that, that on the journeys the fact these people have colored pencils and paper is that they haven't been deprived of their possessions as no. one can assume no, they there have. There's a certain amount of retention of their you know you say their clothing their possessions so it's not mm -hmm. you say it's hard to rank when something is truly awful in the Auschwitz, level, this is still awful, but not 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 as not as terrible, no, but no, still but, still, but, still nasty, yeah. But but you know, by the same token, I'm a uh, I'm very big on saying no, it wasn't a concentration camp, but yeah. that doesn't minimise the suffering of the people who were yeah, there, and I think exactly. it's important that even if we have our Auschwitzometer, as if you like, yeah. with you know Auschwitz and and even worse than Auschwitz, the extermination camps where you get off the train and you are gassed within minutes. So that is, that's really your scale. And so Dawson yeah, on true. there comes fairly low, but it was still horrible. Yeah, anyway, absolutely. so uh, for, those, for those who are in, interested in what the site is like today, this is the remains of Dawson camp on Google Earth on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is an old 1935 map of the camp when it was first built. And it was actually built for um paramilitary wing of the nazi party the sa um originally and then polish prisoners of war were moved there then the channel islanders then russian forced laborers so i mean dawson has a bit of a horrible history mm. um i'm going to draw your attention to uh the three um there are three sort of buildings within the trees that you can see on the left hand side and those are all original although they've been sort of restored or done up restored is the wrong word maybe renovated over time mm -hmm. it's now those are now used for social housing in dawson today i think the people who live there have no idea that these were originally wow. um internment camps but i did walk around the grounds of this camp i'm not sure if it's the next slide yes it is so um last week i was there this is one of the buildings on the top left hand corner the main picture of me in my red coat there i'm pointing towards the potato cellar, the kartoffel uh, keller there. Um, I'm looking rather blotchy because we've just had the uh, the ceremony at the um, cemetery during which I cried buckets. Uh, so <laughs> I tend to look rather blotchy in these pics. Um, so the, let's have a look at the pictures on the right hand side. The one at the top is a concrete hut platform or a, a bunker. I mean, it's hard to tell without further archaeological work. And at the bottom right hand image, that's uh, the floor of a hut platform. This site today is used by a local archery club and they just showed us what there was there. But on the bottom left-hand corner, I found a little bit of a, a water pipe. Um, you can see me holding a bit of a water yep. pipe and some glass from a window of a barrack. So there are traces of the camp still surviving today. Let's move on now to, to Biberov. So people spent seven weeks in Dawson, and then they moved on south um, in a cold, long train journey. But in second-class train carriages, we're not talking about cattle trucks here. Um, so to Biberach, or as, as it's, you know, um, in the Channel Islands, people sort of anglicise the pronunciation. So it's sort of locally called Biberach. Um, and so what we're looking at here is a, a drawing by Henry Sandwith, who was a local artist. And yes, people took with them what they could carry. The Germans gave lists of what you were allowed to take with you, but people would squeeze into their suitcase extra things like pencils if they were an artist. Or one person took... Um, hairdressing scissors because they were a hairdresser someone else took a sewing machine with them <laughs> into germany wow. you imagine lugging a, a singer sewing machine uh, under your arm for a, a long trip to germany well anyway so we're, what we're looking at here is in the background is the administration block where the germans were um, I'd want to draw your attention to the little clock on top of it. We'll come back to that. And flanking the left and right hand side are barrack blocks in which the islanders were kept. And if we uh, look at the next slide, 
This is Biberach today. And I say today, actually, I took these photos in 2006. And on the left hand side, and indeed on the right hand side, these are different views of that administration block um, where the Germans were. That's the only thing that survives because the site has now been turned into a police training academy. Of course, the barrack blocks went in the 1970s and what still survives is the administrative block. So on the right hand side, this is Bill Wilton, who is no longer alive. He's a former internee. He was a child in the camp. Um, you can see the clock tower just above his head. Mm -hmm. If we switch to the left hand photograph, which was taken in 2009, look at the right hand side just beyond the vehicles of that left hand side photo and you can see the clock tower is now on the ground um, and that's because it was deemed unsafe and they've turned it into a little kind of memorial now to the internees because that clock tower is something that dictated their lives you know at such mm. and such a time they got up at such and such a time roll call etc um, this is Wurzak. Wurzak in 1959 became bad Wurzak, the town got um, spa status. But during the war, it was Wurzak and the internees were put in this schloss in a castle. Um, it was, you know, damp and in a bad state of repair, but this is where they were held. It had been a, um, a school before the war. And um, today it's also partially a school. One wing of it has been knocked down. Uh, one part of it is um, a, a hotel but it's a sort of hotel for, for seniors, um, sort of a particular German thing. Anyway, so this, the photograph you can see on the right hand side here was taken at Liberation because, of course, cameras were not allowed. Um, and at Liberation, people could swap the contents of their Red Cross parcels with local people. And the Germans, you know, had no food, but they had luxury goods, if you like, and the people in the camp had food from the Red Cross parcels, but no luxury goods. So there was, you know, a swapping. And so there are some photographs that exist from Liberation. Uh, this is Schloss Wurzak today. So I'll just flip back to the image. This sort of triangular roof is um, incorrect. <laughs> so you can see it doesn't have a triangular right. roof, but, um, you know, it's it's now in very good repair. The, the building's been restored. And Laufen, the last of the camps, do you know, I haven't been to Laufen. This is the one I haven't, whoops, Daisy. This is the one I haven't been to. Um, I do intend to visit, of course. Uh, Laufen, as you can see from the right-hand side image, sorry, it's a little pixelated. This was also a schloss, also a castle. So this is the camp for the single men. And uh, you can see down in the cellar of the camp, uh, this is the place where the men socialised. Uh, and let's just have a look at Compiègne, the transit camp. People were here for three months. So this was the transit camp for those deported in February 1943. So my husband's uh, grandparents and father were in this camp. And let's just start with this aerial photograph on the top left hand corner. Um, I don't know now, this is going to be hard to describe, right? Look at the left hand side of that photograph, look halfway down and you might be able to see a um, an N shape um, on the diagonal. Actually, let me rotate my, my arm <laughs> that way. Everything's uh, turned around and I, it's flipped with the camera. Um, it's sort of an N shape or horseshoe shape. And that is the camp. So it was sort of uh, arranged on three sides around a, um, a parade ground. It used to be an old military barracks. Yep, we and it. Today, what so I, in each of those three sides of the camp, one side was for French political prisoners, one side was for French Jews, and one side was for Americans, because once America entered the war, the Germans rounded up American citizens who happened to be in France. So, for example, people who were playing with touring jazz bands, for example, it's just one example of Americans who happened to be in France. Um, they were put in one wing of the camp. And when the Channel Islanders were sent there, they were put between the French Jews and the Americans. And the Americans helped them a great deal. They gave them Red Cross parcels. They helped them out. But at the same time, the Channel Islanders, through the barbed wire, saw the Jews and saw the way the French were ill-treating them. Uh, sorry, the Germans were ill-treating them, beg your pardon, saw the French Jews um, scrabbling to eat grass. Um, if a Channel Islander threw a bit of bread to the Jews, it was 
um, you know, people would be fighting each other for bits of bread and the Germans would sort of fire guns and the, the islanders saw a dead body draped on the barbed wire for several days. And so they were, they were seeing atrocities through the barbed wire in one direction and in another direction they saw the Americans who were much better treated and we've got to remember we're dealing with small children witnessing this as well. But of course, we know that small children were um, killed in the Holocaust as well. So mm. I think children during the Second World War saw a lot of things that we would shield, shield children from today. Or it it to is interesting them. that they had the, the different aspects in that same location, though. It doesn't strike me as being the way the Third Reich normally works, where they separate the levels of of of, of I mean, nastiness, I suppose, isn't the right word, but, you know, to have that environment where you have say, Americans who are reasonably well treated right alongside Jews who are being treated terribly in the same environment. It's it's unusual, well, it's, I would have thought. It's not that unusual. Um, different compounds separated by barbed wire. I mean, you see this happening um in some concentration camps where you have more privileged prisoners who have a bargaining value. Um you see, I mean, at Auschwitz, you have the the so-called gypsy camp. We we use the word uh, Roma instead of gypsy today yeah. because of the derogatory connotations of the word gypsy. But there's also the um, yeah. So you see, you do see different categories of prisoners who are kept in different compounds for different reasons. Um, so yeah, and, and it would be a good time to ask the question. Someone asked about the type of guards as well. If, if would there be yes. Wehrmacht guards and SS yes. guards with them being involved no. with who they're guarding? Um, Oh, I see, in different parts of the camp. I mean, generally, we are talking about the Wehrmacht, um, yeah. who are guarding these civilian internment camps. But in um, there comes a point after the first few months when the Wehrmacht are replaced, in Biebrecht and Wurzach at least, by um, the police. Um, and they happen to be old men who fought in World War I and who look after the camps. And a relationship of sorts develops between the islanders and the guards because you find um stories of islanders saying oh well the guard you know slipped an apple through the barbed wire for my daughter or you know an understanding is reached so islanders begin to bribe these policemen with food from the red cross parcels with bars of chocolate with soap things like that. And in exchange, the German soldiers turn a blind eye to certain things. So, for example, in Biebrack and Wurzach, islanders were taken on long walks through the countryside, guarded by Alsatian dogs and soldiers. But this is to give them exercise and to sort of stop them going crazy in the camp. And on those walks, local people would come to this uh, crocodile of prisoners with, with things like eggs to swap for a across parcel goods and the German soldiers turned a blind eye to these transactions because they benefited materially from it so these kind of relationships of understanding build up but you wow. don't see that at Compiègne because people were not taken on walks it was a transit camp for the most part Compiègne was a transit camp for people being sent to concentration camps further east so although the Channel Islanders saw that they themselves were only witnesses, fortunately for them. Uh, just to explain the other images in these in this photograph, on the bottom right hand side, we have the dog tag of my husband's father. And dog tags rarely survive from Compiègne because people were en route to places like Auschwitz and where they were killed. And so, you know, these dog tags don't survive any more than the people survive. So uh, they're quite rare. The Monopoly board belonged to one of the Americans on the American side. Uh, and that included, actually, there were some American citizens deported from the Channel Islands in January 1941 to Compiègne. And so when the Channel Islanders arrived, the American Channel Islanders got the place ready for them, which is really nice. You see that kind of friendship happening. And the top left hand image of the Barrett blocks are the only three Barrett blocks that survive today. And today it is a museum uh, and a memorial to uh, those who were deported. The rest of the camp was actually knocked down between 2000 and 2008. And it really seems very, very incredible to me that people would still be knocking down sites related to the Holocaust that, that late, but um, mm. nonetheless, there we are. Mm. 
I'm uh, just going to show you some quick pictures from Libanau. This was used as an insane asylum uh, during the war. And when it was a camp, it was run by nuns. Um, there are some people who say they remember people in the camp being sent to be euthanized. Uh, use that word in inverted commas because we know how the German, you know, the euthanasia campaign of the Nazis against people with mental disabilities. Um, this photograph at the bottom right hand corner. Uh, I don't know if you can see the, the tall building with the sort of tall spires partially hidden by the trees. If you look at the wartime photograph, you can see at the back this tall building with the spires. Yep. And you can see that same building repeated again on this left hand side image. And again, the focus is on the clock tower because time dictates everybody's day. And this um, little clock tower was made from string. Um, and one of the great things about the Red Cross parcels that people got is that the Red Cross parcels provided raw materials for making arts and crafts. So when you've got your Red Cross parcel, it's all wrapped up in brown paper. So great, you've got brown paper for drawing on. It's tied up with string and string you can use for plaiting. You can undo the threads as they've done with this item and sort of replat it to make items. You've got the tins which you can engrave and you can recycle into all sorts of things. Um, as packing material, they use strips of um, strips of coloured plastic. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Flimsy, very flimsy plastic. And that could be used in, in weaving. And I'll show you some images of that later. So lots of components of the Red Cross parcel, which are just fabulous for people who are artistically minded. So uh, let's have a look now at some images from when people arrived in Biberark. And this was before the Red Cross parcels came. So the first Red Cross parcels came in December 1942 and people were sent away in September 42. So at the bottom photograph, we can see people queuing for food. They've all got their bowls, their soup bowls underneath their arms and they're queuing for soup. Um, so, you know, hunger and malnutrition and illnesses were common as they were in Dorston and people were supposed to have the same ration as the guards but clearly the guards couldn't have survived the war on German rations so they were getting fed better but the islanders were. Uh, here's a quote from Maisie Plain she says the rations were terrible when we first got there we had very little food it was horrible I remember my dad used to give us his bread and he used to eat the soup and there were maggots floating in it so the food was very poor quality. Um, people soon got gastroenteritis. That was the least of their problems. So the top right hand picture shows the cue for the loo. And basically these are, you know, we all know what happens with gastroenteritis, but mm -hmm. it's so interesting and so valuable to have these photo the photographs, these drawings which depict everyday reality. And we can sort of, you know, one's, one's instinct might be to sort of smile or giggle at sketches of people queuing for the loo, but you know, these are the realities when you survive on watery soup that is of very poor quality. People start to get worms, start to get all sorts of digestive problems. And this is the result. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that I talk about with students is not just the ethics, but the I think there's a tendency to draw a veil over the more um, unseemly or disgusting parts of internment life. So let me give you an example. One internee said to me, there was no toilet paper. Now that comment can bounce in one ear and out the other. But if you stop and think about what that meant in terms of clothes getting soiled when there's mm. no toilet paper and there's no washing machines and people, there's no soap. So people are hand washing items in cold water troughs outside. That isn't really going to get rid of the stained clothes. And then you have to hang them up to dry in full view of everyone else. And you can imagine, especially for a, an, a different generation, the humiliation of not only having even clean underwear hanging up for others to see, but the sort of just the horrible kind of disgusting and you can't shower either because it's a month until you get your first shower. You can just, you know, it is unseemly. It is disgusting to think about the consequences of comments like there was no toilet paper. But and, you know, and some people say 
Jilly, don't humiliate people twice. It's humiliating enough for them to kind of not have toilet paper, but they're then to sort of draw attention to this. And I say, well, no, it's part of understanding the horrible reality of being in a camp, that these sorts of indignities and humiliations are all part of the experience. No, I agree, because it, 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 even in the, the POW experience and things like that, it's so often the focus is on the escaping and morale and kind of the, the, the you know, baiting of guards, that kind of thing. And, and the actual day to day experience of living on not enough food and living with lots of other people in a small space. And as you say, no toilet paper, no soap. They kind of get overlooked in, in the kind of the way these stories are told about the heroics kind of sell books more than just as you say talking about the lack of toilet paper so i'm glad i'm glad you're sharing all these details as as yeah as, as frank as they are yes and i think also um you know i've i've interviewed about 65 former internees and um, most of those people are no longer alive and there's also the question of what questions are appropriate to ask somebody in their 80s and 90s because you know there's a sense of decency and not Whereas we, you and I might speak more freely about, let's just call it bodily issues, you mm. would be more respectful talking to somebody who is older, and especially you don't want to traumatise that person by asking them to revisit in their memory these difficult things. So, I mean, interviewing is its own skill, but you have to be very sensitive about what you can ask. So, you know, we, we talk about some issues about, you know, how did women cope with menstruation in these camps? And that also feeds into what I was saying earlier. Um, you know, and I, you, it's very difficult to ask uh, an elderly person about these questions, but I just want to flag up, you know, that these are the realities and these are the humiliations. But let's look at some of these other problems. There are problems with rats and mice and bed bugs and fleas. And um, here's a quote from Reg Thomason, uh, who interviewed, and he said, one morning I woke up to see my hands streaming with blood from the bed bugs. I had to take my bed to pieces to get the eggs out. They smelled horrible and were as big as ladybirds. We used to pull the legs, uh, I should say, off the bunks. Uh, sorry, but no, we used to put the legs of the bunks in Climptons. I'll explain what Climptons are, you might know. Filled yeah. with disinfectant from the hospital, and that stopped them. So Climtons, Clim is milk spelt backwards, and right. Clim was a dried milk product that was found in Red Cross parcels. But they were big tins, so people uh, could use them for a variety of things. And, you know, this quote is really interesting. I've never seen a bed bug. It didn't occur to me that they had a smell. You know, so it's, you know, these sorts of quotes are really, um, you know, important i think and and you uh -huh. see these sketches done by internees to show the problem with vermin um so let's just look let's return to the subject of the red cross parcels being used for uh recycling to create art objects so here's a picture of a pile of red cross tins at biberach so this was taken at liberation and the first thought um might be Gosh, that uses up a lot of space at the campgrounds. Why didn't people sort of have this taken away? Well, one simple reason that if they'd allowed so these tins, once they're given by the Red Cross, they are the property of the prisoners. If the prisoners had handed them over to the Germans, the Germans could have put turned this metal to the armaments industry and turned mm. it into bombs for bombing Britain. Now you understand why prisoners don't want to let go of these tins. So in a way collecting these tins deprives the Germans in their war effort. So it's a, it's an important bit of kind of solidarity with uh, your own citizens. Definitely. And um, these posters were made by Eric Sirrett, who was a, a Guernsey man in Biberac, and he was an artist. And all of these posters advertise um, arts and crafts exhibitions in the camp. Uh, which is which is lovely. I mean, I, I kind of really like these posters, and um, there are there's the odd photograph taken by the guards of arts and crafts exhibitions. So I, I you know, I'm um, particularly interested to see the images in the posters of the objects that people are making. No, uh, an, an amazing uh, Art Deco fonts. I'm 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 a former um, print designer and typographer, so seeing those fonts there that they're presumably getting that from memory as well because they, they wouldn't have much access to newspapers and books there so that's just mm -hmm. some amazing artwork just just for artwork's sake 
yes definitely and i always say to uh to my students that we might sort of look at this artwork and say oh well that's that's quality art you know gosh that's that person must have been trained and then you get sketches like this one which are very amateur um and you get sketches by kids as well and i think that all of these are equally valuable in narrating the experience of occupy of um of internment so i mean this one you can see women knitting um playing cards basically passing the time but look at their interior design they've got a union jack on the wall behind them and you know probably some sketches of home drawn from memory but we'll have a look at some of those sketches in a bit first i wanted to show you um some more images from the camp this is uh, the two sketches are from Wurzak. So this is inside the castle, inside the Schloss. And you can see uh, in one particular room, they've got single beds. Uh, in the picture below, there are bunk beds. Um, you can see, you know, the, the Spartan nature of the room with the tables, the stools, um, people's overcoats hung up. Um, these these are wonderful these images for for mining them for information about mm. objects so i mean i i won't i don't want to spend too long belaboring every picture or else you and i are going to be here for hours but bottom right hand no picture. but i mean as i can see as an archaeologist the detail in those of just questions to ask you know what what was that why did you have that and what my, my while those images up on the screen how did the hierarchy work within the huts and things like that was there a democracy was someone given kind of hut master hut mistress matron did it vary <laughs> from camp to camp yeah so you have room leader barrack leader um and a camp committee which has um a sort of a, a group that will sort of run the camp and at the top is the british camp captain or camp senior different name depending on which camp you're in and the hierarchy is mostly male apart from where you have women's rooms your your hut or your room leader can only be female in a female right. room but mostly it's a male hierarchy here's uh, another memory from Maisie Plain a former internee from Jersey she says we were in a big room with bunk beds on both sides with a big table down the middle and a wood-burning stove the beds were very close together. You didn't have any privacy. There was nowhere you could go. And I think as a consequence of that lack of privacy, one of the objects that people like to make were these tiny boxes about this big. And these were made by plaiting red cross parcel string around a tin of um, tins that were sort of round. And this big contained, I think there was a cheese tin there was all sorts of food which sort of, you know, came, came in forms that food shouldn't come in. Cheese shouldn't really come in a tin. But anyway, no, um, yeah. and the uh, cellophane was the word I was looking for earlier. These are plaited with cellophane from the Red Cross parcel packing material. Um, but also people could dye the string using natural dyes. So if we look at the Red Cross, um, the Red Cross, the, the Union Jack rather box, the, the blue would come from ink. Uh, the red, hmm. They were, there were all sorts of experiments for dyeing with various natural, uh, they might have found clothes that where the colour bled and so they could quickly mm. dip their, their string in. But anyway, so people were making these little boxes where they could keep their private personal goods that they didn't want other people to, to look at. So it's a little bit of personal space within the, the noise and the chaos of the camp. And I think one thing we never get from camps is the sense of sound and the noise of, you know, a thousand people packed into a small area. Um, so let's have a look at some of the themes that we see in these objects. We have, um, I call this one dreaming of freedom. If you're in a grey, dismal camp, you yearn for the colour of nature that you can see through the barbed wire, but you can't blooming get at. And so we have lots of images of flowers. Uh, these, uh, the the string flowers in the middle are all coloured with natural dyes. Um, we have flowers drawn on bits of wood, knots from the wood of the packing case, cases from Red Cross parcels. We've got a handbag on the right hand side with a cornucopia with flowers on made from parcel string. We've got a sampler on the left and you can see it depicts um, a hunt. You can see a horse and hounds and a, and a um, deer and flowers. 
let's have a look at some more themes from the camp. We've got um, thinking of England, remembering the English nationality of various yeah. uh, internees. And these are little postcard sized uh, images. And one of them is a greetings card, but they are this, even though, let's have a look at the greetings card first, even though it's a Christmas card, it's not very Christmassy. And it's showing a very traditional view of England with the leaded windows and the thatch cottage. And as you can see, the roses around the door. And if you like, it's just this idyllic image of it's, old yeah, England. The romanticised chocolate box England. Yeah, exactly. no, it, you can understand exactly what that's where they're not going to be thinking of, you know, with all due respect, yeah, you know, Manchester's canals. It's gonna be. It's gonna be the 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 England of 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 Shakespeare and Wordsworth, and so yeah, amazing images. Yes, yes. And actually, what better Christmas gift can you give someone in a card than this vision of home? I think that's sort yeah. of the best thing you can give someone. But also, you see the same thing going on with um, thinking of the Channel Islands, and you can see top left hand corner. This is Castle Cornet in Guernsey. Bottom left-hand corner is the Corbier Lighthouse, a famous landmark in Jersey, which you can see repeated on the bottom image, the birthday greetings. On the right-hand side, we have an engraved shell case, which I'll talk about later, but it's got an engraved map of Guernsey on it. And in the middle, the lady holding the um, painting, this is Frau Fleischer, and she was the wife of... Um, Herr Fleischer or Dr. Fleischer, who was the German um, doctor in the town of Bibrak who looked after the internees when they got ill. And so as a gift, the internees or, or one particular internee called Ethel Cheesewright painted this watercolour of the island of Sark from memory. To, to give in thanks. And this is one of her finest paintings. It's uh, it just I mean, Sark is gorgeous, but this is a particularly gorgeous uh, painting. And of course, when you're in an internment camp, you can spend as long as you like painting because there yeah. ain't no time. Chipping. Time is something you've got plenty of. Yeah. Um, keeping identity was important. Uh, a lot of people made these Union Jack badges. And you can see in the photograph in the middle, this skinny, skinny chap. This is my husband's father who caught tuberculosis in Biberac. And this is him at the end of the war looking um, very skinny. He nearly died, but he survived. He actually died young. He died at 52 years old because I think of having uh, having had tuberculosis. And you can see he's got a Union Jack badge on. Um, the football team on the bottom left hand corner, they're all wearing their little Union Jack badges. Um, in Laufen Camp, which is where this photograph was taken, there were both British and American internees and they would play each other at football. So this is the British team. We've got an RAF roundel at the top, which people can see on the underside of the aeroplane wings. Um, so when people were wearing those badges, when they went on walks, there was sort of solidarity between them and the planes in the sky. The mug, the bottom right hand corner, has got the Guernsey crest on. So you can see that you are um, raising a toast to Guernsey. Actually, I have a Guernsey ma uh, mug here. Mm, with the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I always have my Channel Island mugs. Um, the top right hand image is uh, what's called a Guernsey can and it's a traditional milk jug design but people took them to Biberac and used them for boiling water to make cups of tea um, they could only get tea in the Red Cross parcels but I don't know if you can just make out that there is engraved around the top um, I think it says Biberac and people also had to pass the time in the camp with sports and games so we've got um handmade chess set i love this the wood came from the packing crate of red cross parcel and the thing with chess is it takes ages to carve the pieces and then it takes ages to play a game of chess and so it's one of those games that you really want to play when you're in turn because it uses up lots of time uh, people also created shove hateney boards um, they played cribbage that's what the bottom board is the um on the left hand side, the middle image is actually a little wooden badge of a shop halfpenny um, board that was given as first prize for the winner of the shop halfpenny um, contest. Wow. <laughs> and you can see the certificate that came with it. You can see the little um, shop halfpenny board in the middle. And on the right hand side is um, ooh, 
got a sensitive screen here, was a trophy made in Laufen for a football match. And it was made from recycled Red Cross parcel tins. And you can see that there's an eagle on top, uh, a kind of German eagle to mark that this trophy was made in Germany. Uh, people would also pass the time, not just in playing board games, but also in art classes. So one of the things people would do is they would say to the guards, you know, if I give you a bar of Red Cross, pass, uh, Red Cross chocolate, will you get me a set of postcards of the town? And um, so some of the internees have these sets of postcards and you can see the original postcard on the right hand side. And then the art class, everyone would reproduce that postcard and you can see various attempts uh, various levels of proficiency of reproducing that postcard in in class uh, some are better than others <laughs> the top mm. right hand makes me makes me chuckle <laughs> not yeah not the, the best. some some are more destined to be uh, uh picasso some more destined to be monet from that some a bit more yeah. beautiful so a little bit more architectural but it's it, fascinating yes. and it's coming up in the sidebar about about the, the obviously the red cross were vital to the existence everything and i'm assuming they got a lot more red cross parcels than your average um location within the third reich because you know it depends they're enlisted men's camps for, for people for military serve their own their officers camps but presumably they're getting a higher than average number of support from the red cross no, the the average was one parcel per person per week that's that was what the red cross intended so um in germany of course it depended on where you are in the war because of supply lines yeah but on average <clears throat> all internees civilian internees or military prisoners of war should have been getting one parcel per person per week i say should have getting because of course there's always the case where the germans are stealing the parcels yeah, or yeah. raiding them etc but on the whole on the whole um that's how it was for everyone okay thank you there was also theater you see theater happening in all camps and um these are just some posters advertising theater shows uh usually one barrack block block would be converted into a theater and everyone would take their stool from their barrack room and you know sit on it to watch the theater but actually the main image the biggest image here is um a sketch of the camp scenery as sketched by one internee and as made by another internee. So Henry Sandwith drew this picture, but the scenery was made by Freddie Williams. Um, I, you know, I feel very fortunate to sort of know the names of the protagonists because they're spoken mm. about a lot by the internees I've, I've interviewed over the last 15 years. Uh, food was a real, uh, People were very focused on food because it was always scarce and because there was so much anxiety about where the next uh, food parcel was coming from. And I think the only time that I felt that sort of anxiety is, if I don't know if you remember, just at the beginning of lockdown, the supermarket shelves emptied. And my experience of going to the supermarket was aisle after aisle, nothing. And I started to get so anxious about, are we going to have enough food? So, I mean, you know, it's very we're very fortunate and to have not experienced that kind of food insecurity um, in the way that they had it in the camp, but it helps you to understand the, the anxiety. And uh, let me just say a little word about what we're looking at. This is George Norman in the photograph. He's no longer with us. He carved this wooden spoon as a child. And if you're just being fed soup every day, you need a spoon. And on the bottom left-hand image is a spoon one end and a fork on the other so this is a spork and oh, so you can yeah. have your soup and then spear the food in the red cross tin let's look at the sampler on the top left in the center just to sort of it's hard to work out what you're looking at here so let me tell you in the center you've got the, the stove in the room on the right hand image just going around that little coat of arms you've got beetroot underneath it is a bowl of beetroot soup at the bottom, you've got three open tins of food. On the left-hand side, you've got a bunk bed. Underneath that is a stool. Underneath that is a pitcher of mint tea that was provided every day, uh, which apparently was not as nice as the mint tea we get today. It was, mm -hmm. you know, crap mint tea. Um, let's look at the bottom sketch is of people bringing the, it says consomme delivery at Bibrac. Obviously there's humor there. It is the watery soup that the internees had to, um, they're, they're pulling it on a sledge through the snow to the barrack huts here. On the right-hand side at the top, we have um, 
I'll just draw attention to the bowl of soup at the at the bottom of the picture. And in the bottom right hand corner, we have the bowl of soup at the top. And there's a hope that um, in Bibrac 1942, it might be a bowl of soup, but hopefully you'll be black back in Blighty in 1943 having a, uh, a Christmas pudding. But obviously that didn't happen. And I just also wanted to talk briefly, very briefly, and just this one image about the um, internees were very keen as soon as they could at being independent from the Germans. It was a matter of pride. And so independent in terms of food and fuel. And with the food, with the Red Cross parcels, that enabled them to start to sort of ditch this horrible, watery, maggoty soup. But people would use it to fill their hot water bottles or to um, clean tables and things like that or to wash in because it was warm. Uh, if we have a look at this Christmas menu from 1942, it's written in um, fairly accurate French and... It's written in, in fail, it's written in French or aims to be written in French to sort of give the idea that this is haute cuisine. Mm. Um, but the way that the food is described also has touches about the Red Cross. So let's have a look at um, oh gosh, do you know I'm gonna have a look at my my laptop below because I can enlarge the pictures so I can see them more clearly because this text is a little bit hard to read. Um, so we've got, um, for example, well, typically, I'll just talk typically about what you see yeah. on these menus. You'll be you'll be sort of something like um, Christmas pudding a la Red Cross and uh, or Le Croix Rouge or something like that. And there'll be lots of references to food that you could find in the Red Cross parcels, but deliberately omitting the food provided by the Germans. So you'll find um, you might find um, dupe. Pan Alemania, meaning German bread, meaning you know that the bread in the recipe or in the menu was mouldy. And so there'll be references like that. Mm. But as well as trying to get mm. out of using German food, people would create their own vessels for preparing food. So you see Monty Manning here on the right hand side with a Red Cross parcel tin. Um, and he has he's fashioned some tongs. So he can hold that in the belly of the fire and heat it up. And so, um, again, he's heating up his own food. He's not relying on the Germans to do it. And so people would find ways to um, they would create from Red Cross tins little frying pans where they could fry Red Cross food on their stoves in their rooms. So it wouldn't have to come from the German kitchen. So it's 101 ways to get independent of the Germans. And that's uh, interesting to see. Were they so, allowed to grow vegetables that, that came up in the yes. sidebar? Yes, yes, they were. Um, but you can imagine that you have to wait for those vegetables to be ready and you've got a thousand mouths to feed. Yes, they could. Yeah. But there was a big problem with not enough fresh fruit and veg. So people would frequently cut themselves on Red Cross parcels. And without the vitamins that they needed from fresh fruit and veg, those cuts would become infected. And you get some people having to have fingers amputated because of the mm. infections. And so you can see the need to do this trading with people outside the barbed wire to swap your Red Cross parcel um, chocolate or soap and to give it up for apples for fresh produce that you can get from local people to, you know, because you need it for your health. Um, Let's talk about the August Bank Holiday Carnival. These are propaganda photos, of course. So there was a carnival in August 1943 in Biberag, and people would um, recycle charity clothing, which they were given, and sheets and blankets and their beds, and they would turn them into these costumes that we can see. Um, it was a fancy dress carnival or a sort of procession, but it's very interesting to look at the people who people are dressing up as. So, for example, we've got the figure on the left hand side, we've got the figure of justice holding a sword and she's also got some scales. There'll be justice for the Germans when the war is over. Let's look at the right hand image. We've got Uncle Sam, one of the mm. allies. We've got Britannia, great sort of pa patriotic figure. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's very interesting to look at these photographs and uh, there were people dressed up as George and the Dragon and, you know, these just patriotic symbols. Very, very interesting to see but that even though the Germans... Were these ever picked up by the Germans as being, you know, people dressing up, 
uh, is that could that count as being provocative if you're a German guard and you're seeing someone dressing up as Uncle Sam? Was it anybody ever punished for, no, for, for that? They weren't, they weren't punished. They weren't punished. Um, there was no retribution. I think people were already behind, behind barbed wire. That retribution had already been taken. Yeah. And so there was this people could push, could push the limits of things that they could not push the limits on in concentration camps, but they could course, in internment yeah, yeah. camps because uh, in the words of one internee, they had tamed the guards by bribing them with chocolate to turn a blind eye to this sort of thing. Mm. Uh, quick word about domesticating the camps, domesticity, you get in order, remember you've got children in these camps and it's in the interest of everyone to make the camp appear more friendly for the kids or else the kids are going to be <clears throat> traumatized and so you have um things like women crocheting colorful blankets for the bar for the bunk beds making slippers making doilies for the tables you can see the top picture shows somebody's made an armchair out of a packing crate um on the bottom left hand picture your eye is drawn to the pretty flowers and then you notice the watchtower and the barbed wire yeah. The planting flowers makes it a more um, pleasant, I use that word inverted commas, place to live. But if you look at the top right hand corner, you can see cabbages being grown in the camp garden, but also flowers. So people are giving up space that could have been used to grow fresh food to grow flowers, to lift their spirits, which tells you the importance of morale, of making yeah, the definitely. camp lose its sting, really. It's, it's retaining an element of control, isn't it? If it, it's it's you are an environment you said earlier about the importance of the clock towers indicating you know, there's there's appels and there's times to do things, but if you're con if you're taming the military environment around you with flower beds and things like that, you're you're subverting in some ways the authorities being imposed on you. You're you're taking control of the situation. Yes, yes, indeed. You also see camp fashion. So people are weaving from parcel string handbags, hats. So this is in the in the family camps, obviously not in the in the men's camps. The men get very slovenly and their clothes get all full of holes because the women aren't around to sew them up. So it's rather rather amusing that the men's camps are suffering. The men do actually start to do knitting and needlework and things like that because there ain't no choice. Um, and we have, you know, shoes, belts. Of course, if you've if you've traveled if you've left your home country wearing the clothes that you were wearing and probably you're wearing several layers of clothes so that you've got a change of clothes people are going to want to brighten up what they've got by by supplementing it in this way we've got hair curlers at the bottom made of bits of metal from a tin um we've got this pink ring was made from a denture nice <laughs> and we've got that the handbag at the top the pearlescent handbag made from cellophane, which wrapped the tins of cigarettes. Yeah. So cigarettes came in wow. tins as well as packets. Um, so let's look more at brightening up clothes. You could make buttons. That's what the top right hand image is. And colorful belts, great way of brightening up clothes. Um, and if your clothes got worn out, you could take them to be exchanged for charity clothes from the Red Cross. And that's what's happening in the image above. Someone's trying to um, change their trousers. You can see it's a very holy pair of trousers. Um, you can see evidence of babyhood in the camp. So this is Carol Ashton. Oh, well, she's, uh, yeah, Carol Ashton's her. Her maiden name. Um, she's uh, still alive. I know how I've interviewed her. This is she was born in the camp, uh, remembering that pregnant women were um, deported. Somebody's yeah. made her a high chair out of Red Cross packing crates. This was her baptism certificate, remembering there are priests in the camp who could baptize kids. Um, and, you know, a welcome from everyone in the room on the left hand side uh, to this baby. And you can see evidence of childhood in the camp. This is Carol again. You can down at the bottom in the photograph in the middle, she's pushing a little a little uh, pram that was made from Red Cross parcel tins. But you can see a variety of toys um, made in the camp. And on the bottom left hand image, I'll just draw attention to that. For the first Christmas, the men in the camp got together to create toys for, for the kids um, out of wood. 
because the men were the only ones who kind of knew how to do carpentry. The women did the sewing, the men did the carpentry. They used traditional the traditional roles, yeah. Traditional roles, yeah. You do see some crossover, but um, the men are using the wood from Red Cross parcel crates. And if you look at the photograph in the background behind the men, you can see little cots, little dolls' cots mm. in the foreground. Well, you can see the dolls' house, but you can also make out, I think, their little cranes. It's hard to see what these slightly cross shape things are in the foreground in the middle foreground um but you know yeah, they would like it yeah lanes it's sort of hard to identify sometimes another theme you see coming up in a lot of um artifacts and images is the barbed wire so it's it's like sort of you know you're going to draw a sketch what's in front of you all the time so you see these images of barbed wire but of the landscape beyond it that they can't get at um the badge that you see in the bottom right hand corner is not made from actual barbed wire. Um, it's made, I think, from aluminium solder. And some of the internees wore them as a kind of um, symbol of identity. I'm a prisoner, but sort of, and I'm defiant and I haven't given in. It's a kind of solidarity. This is who I am now. But there's a, you can sort of sense mm. a French fist behind it. Um, again, another typical image that recurs is the same four walls of your barrack hut where you're stuck. So you can see the bunk beds, you can see the stools, um, you can see the beds, and that's, you know, you can see the obsession with that. Um, images of the camp. So this is, you know, a great time when you don't have photographs because cameras aren't allowed. You have these images which you can kind of put together to recreate the the camp in artwork and the embroidery in the middle was actually done by a man so that's an example of a sort of crossover in gender roles here um, and you can see it's a wonderful map of Biberat camp and if you look if I draw your attention towards that embroidery at the bottom you can see an h-shaped building and that is the building that still survives with a little clock tower on top and you can see it's the white clock tower with a little brown roof that's not the colour it is in real life, but, you know, you've got to work with what coloured threads you've got. You see resistance happening in the camps, too. Let's look at Monty Manning here in the middle. So let's remember that uh, from 1941 onwards, you have the V sign campaign that Churchill um, that's probably associated with Churchill, but he didn't invent it. And the V sign campaign swept across occupied Europe and including the Channel Islands. Look at Monty Manning's V sign beard. V sign moustache, V sign lapels, he's a walking V. Look at the shoe sole at the bottom left hand corner. Can you see a V? Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Think about the wet footprints you can leave mm. through the camp. Fabulous. There were also V sign badges. So if you look at the bottom right hand side, um, this is a V sign badge actually made in occupied Guernsey that was taken to the camp. People would score little Vs underneath the, the king's profile and um, to symbolize a V for victory, for allied victory. Um, the, I know we're low on time, so I won't go into the, the other ones. Um, you can see more V signs coming across in greetings cards, in engraved mugs, um, in embroideries. Uh, I'll just say a word about the embroidery in the top right-hand corner because it's, it's rather good. It's, um, on the, on the surface, it is remembering, it is talking about George the V, but George the VI was actually on the throne. I don't know if the Germans were keeping count about which British monarch was on the throne. Perhaps they were. But if anyone embroidered, oh, this is just an embroidery to George the V. Yeah, <laughs> with all of these Vs. Because, I mean, this stuff is very hard. You know, we talked about the fact they weren't punished for some. It's hard. Some of these are very obviously these that there's not they're, they're, yeah. they are what they are i mean again w was anybody singled out for, for punishment for this or, no, no. or even quite strict tellings off or did they I don't, think, I don't think the germans were monitoring what people made in art classes and wow. also the women say you know because embroidery women's mm. work that's not threatening the women say the germans weren't interested in what they were doing so i think you know people could get away with a lot I mean, the Germans were not in the barrack rooms every day staring at people and monitoring them. Um, you know, they would do inspections, but, you know, you somebody along the corridor tips the wink, the Germans are coming and you just yeah. move, a, move a piece of paper over your yeah, artwork. Yeah. You know, it's um, they're not they're not monitoring things that closely. 
So let's talk about liberation. We're getting towards the end now. You'll be very pleased to hear those who are looking at their watches. Um, April 1945 is when the camps were liberated. 20, 23rd of April for Biberak, which was St. George's Day, which is uh, very patriotic, mm. incidentally. This wonderful shell case was engraved. Uh, the Germans fled as the Allies came, leaving behind armaments. So this um, shell case was, was liberated by a prisoner and engraved uh, a, little, uh, a little prayer in Guernsey French, which sort of blessed everyone back in Guernsey. Uh, you can see an engraving of Guernsey with all of the flowers around it because Guernsey is a very floral island. And on the other side of the shell case is an image of um, the town of Biberac itself. Mm. Uh, where they could finally go <laughs> after after they were liberated. And at the top, it just remembers uh, liberation and the people who the shell case was made for. And I love this little poem. This is Liberation from Wurzag. Goodbye to the Schloss. We've got another boss since the Fuhr has fallen rather low. When we get the keys, goodbye to the fleas. Thank you for the stay, but we must go. <laughs> Fabulous. It's one of my favorites. It is great. And uh, this image here of um, we're, we're getting to the end now. Now, this card was actually made in Christmas 1945 when people were back in the Channel Islands again. And it was made by Henry Sandwith, that artist who we see a lot of in Biberag. And it was a card that former internees gave each other that Christmas. And um, this little message is very redolent of 1940s expressions. Um, to all fellow members of Barrack 20, greetings. One memorable day in June of this year of liberty, we trooped out of Barrack 20 for the last time. And after giving the camp and most of its inmates a well-merited raspberry, we separated and each man went his way. It's possible that at that moment, many of us vowed that never again did we wish to set eyes on such a hard boiled mob of carvers up. And yet, in spite of this most understandable resolve, I, for one, on this coming Christmas day, intend, with luck, to raise my glass in memory of the old gang, friends, every one of them, and every one of them, one of the best. Good luck and good scrounging wherever you are. So I think that's rather a a lovely, a lovely card that was that still made. In the that is really well. good. Yeah. And I just wanted to end with uh, two pictures. This is my penultimate slide, just to talk about reconciliation and links between the Channel Islands and those towns today in Germany, which are strong. And so, on the left-hand side, top and bottom, we are looking at Wurzak. Um, this photograph was taken in 2008. So we can see a visit of former internees to Bad Wurzag, um, where they're shown around the Schloss, where you visit the cemetery and lay flowers on the graves of those who died. And on the right hand side, we're looking at former internees. This was taken in 2006, visiting the police academy now on the site of the camp. And again, there's always a visit to the cemetery to lay flowers on those who died. And there's a very warm welcome by the inhabitants of the town who have internees come and stay with them in their houses. And they treat them to dinner and look after them. And there's a real warm relationship between those towns. And when that relationship began, um, in more recent decades, I would say it didn't begin immediately. There was a process of, of church services and the Germans apologizing, even though it was not the current generation who interned these people, the power of the apology was so important. It was important for people to hear this. And now there's very strong relationships between these two mm. towns of the Channel Islands and there's many friendships. And reconciliation is something I always say that is a process, a long process that can only take part in the hearts of individuals. It, it doesn't, it's not a matter of political leaders shaking hands. Reconciliation is a personal yeah, thing. No, I agree. And my final image is here from Dawson from last week. I don't know if any Channel Islanders have been to Dawson in the last 80 years because it was a, a camp they associate with fear, with terror, with um, it's a very dark memory. There isn't positivity associated with it. Um, so I said that there were Polish prisoners of war in the camp before the islanders came. So the islanders lay alongside the Poles in the cemetery 
it's a very sad place. As soon as I got to this area of the cemetery, I just started crying. Um, and uh, in the photographs, let's look at the top left hand side. It isn't that I'm short. I'm five foot seven. These men are very tall. Uh, on the left hand side, we have uh, Tobias Stockhoff, who is the Burgermeister of uh, Dorsten. On the left hand side, we have Martin uh, Kocher, who's the uh, Kocher, other who's the archivist, and uh, there's the chief of staff on the top right hand side. Uh, uh, Carsten Hartman who came along and we lay flowers and it was a, a very moving ceremony um, so yes uh, we've we've remembered the internees in Dorsten and I think we can stop sharing now and stop showing my slides yeah well I mean amazing thank you very much Dr Carr it was amazing um, a couple of questions at the end of there about who relieved the camps I mean none of them were ended up being in the Soviet sector either they all relieved by British and Canadians is that right uh, by Laufen was liberated by the Americans. Right. Wurzak and Bibrak were liberated by the Free French, and the okay. Americans came soon after. And so how did they, they get back home? Was it a long journey back? No, they were flown on a Dakota plane, oh. on a series of Dakota planes, which only could take about 40 people at a time. So uh, people stayed in an American military camp in um, Mengen, and they were put in, uh, thank you for your comments, folks. I can I can see them, they're coming up on screen. Um, they were put in, uh, in large tents in the American camp because uh, the Americans had taken over an air base that had been bombed. And so everyone was living under, under canvas and the Americans fed them rich foods, which the islanders promptly um, regurgitated because their stomachs weren't used to rich foods. But they were flown home alphabetically in Dakota Plains to Hendon Air, air Base in the UK. And they had to wait several months before they could then get back to the Channel Islands. And so mm. uh, remembering that many of them were deported because they were born in England, they stayed with relatives in England right. or went to displaced persons camps in England before going back to the Channel okay. Islands. Well, I mean, my last question really is you've covered very brilliantly the the, the defiance, the spirit, the, the practicality, the arts and crafts, all, all the aspect, and now the reconciliation. But what about the the, the middle period? Uh, when some of these returning deportees, did they suffer from PTSD? Did they have difficulties dealing with that? Because, you know, that that's the, the darker side of it. And I know, you know, you've done a lot of work trying to to um, you know, but get their, their experiences down on paper so you can share it with other people. But what was it difficult for some of them to adjust to, yeah. to, to normal life again? Yes, um, I think that's a very interesting question. And uh, if you do invite me back, I'll be very happy to talk about the post-traumatic stress disorder that was very certainly experienced by those who are in concentration camps. I promise I won't go so much over time then. But of these deportees, um, because the only people who are still alive when I started interviewing from 2006, they were all children mm. or at best teenagers. And so when I say to them, did your parents have post-traumatic stress disorder? You know, this was a disorder that was given its name in the 1980s, even though people used other terms such as, you know, shell shock and things in the First World War. Um, you know, it's very hard to, to sort of because you'd say to kids, did your parents have this? And they and the parents, of course, would, would try and shield the children and not talk about how they were. Um, thanks for your comments. Uh, thank, not talk about how they were feeling in front of the kids. Mm. And so what I get now is kids saying to me, oh, well, like kids, these are people in their 80s and 90s um, who are, yes, some of them are still suffering psychologically um one one woman i mean i consider all of these people to be my friends i've been you know going to the um reunions for 15 years um but you the the person who i, I won't give names who who runs the guernsey deportee association um she gets very affected by talking about this period and so there are times when she sort of clocks off from working for the association because it's too much mm. um people do talk about not not like not liking being in rooms with the doors closed because it's being shut in and um i think it certainly has had its toll on their lives and i think mostly i see the toll in terms of health physical health mm. um of people dying young there's a lot of people who say yes my my parents died in the 1950s my father died early my mother died early they got cancer they got you know this sort of the psychological toll 
had a physical effect on uh, on life expectancy of the adults. That that much I can say. Well, that and that's a, a good way to kind of uh, balance with all those amazing images and those colourful badges and the tins and the embroideries and things. Is that there was this long term negative aspect of it? And I think if we have you back, well, we will have you back. There's no question about that. Is that <laughs> the theme of this of this week has been the variety of experiences people from the Channel Islands would have had. So that in that era, post-war, you've got people who were away with the military services representing the Channel Islands, but perhaps in Burma or somewhere. You've got those who stayed on the Channel Islands dealing with rations, occupation, those that were seeing slave laborers, those that were deported, all potentially living in the same street. So, you know, where I'm from in Essex, the people in Essex had broadly lived the same five years of the war, there were, apart from those that were away with the services. But as I say, in Guernsey or Jersey, such a variety of experiences within within the same almost apartment building. And that must have been difficult to how people could compare those experiences. What was worse? What was, you know, what was easier, more difficult? Was it better being there, better being away from? These are long-term questions that I'm sure you're 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 getting into. Yeah, and I think that uh, I I you know talk of it in terms of everybody being traumatized to one extent yeah. or the other, and there was a sense of um, some stories being pushed pushed to the side for many decades because you know the the main story was the experience of the majority, which was either being occupied or being evacuated but it was the minority even yeah. if it was one in 20 people who were deported um and so you know at a time when people were telling their stories in the newspaper after the war you still have the war going on in the far east and that dominating the news headlines and that pushing stories out so yeah. um you know it's it's interesting to see this uh the way that some stories become mainstream and some stories are are edited out of the story for a long time well, I think we will leave it there. And folks, I put a, a link to uh, two or three of Dr. Carr's books in the description below. There's quite a few more of them, uh, academic titles, university titles, popular ones. There's a variety of things out there. There's some websites and things you've written for and spoken at. So there's lots more resources you can look at, folks. All of that is in the description below. But basically, it remains me now to, to thank Dr. Jilly Carr for, for coming on. And, and the extension will be, uh, 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 you'll be invited back whenever you want. We can we can do the, the political prisoners. We can talk about the experience of the Islanders, whatever you want to talk about, really. But it's been great talking to you. So thank you very much. So You're very welcome. It's always a, it's always a pleasure for me to talk about my favorite subject. Well, we, we could tell. So there we are. So, folks, I will see you all again in, in an hour, no, two and a half hours time for, Doc, uh, for Eric Lee. So thanks very much for everybody watching. This Paul Woodage and Julie Calf, World War II TV. I will see you all again later. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye.